Star Wars Outlaws. This is a game I, and I'm sure many of you guys, are thoroughly intrigued by. People ask me, Luke, what game are you most hyped for? And while you guys know hype makes you stupid, and I would never stoop so low as to be hyped over something, a game that I am actually genuinely interested in is Star Wars Outlaws. And a lot of that is because of these trailers that have dropped. This initial like world premiere trailer revealed that it was coming from Massive Entertainment. And if you don't know Massive, Massive are the guys behind The Division. And they just recently did Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. The team doing this is, I believe, The Division team. It's a separate team from the guys that did Avatar. But it seems to be a very epic, huge in scope Star Wars game being put together by a very capable team of developers that have produced some very well-received, very large games. Now, this trailer, this was the announcement trailer. It was pretty, you know, cinematic. It doesn't really give you any information. And so we all saw this and we're like, okay, I mean, what am I supposed to take away from this? Thematically, it looks cool and interesting. It doesn't look bad, but this doesn't tell us much of anything. I mean, this could be a card game for all we know. Like, We've seen plenty of games that look really cool in cinematic trailers, and then you see the gameplay, you see what it actually is, and you're like, oh, it's a slot machine. So, like, it doesn't really give you any real information. But it sets the tone. Thematically, it seems interesting. And she zips off on the speeder bike. They show all this stuff, and it, it seems interesting. But that's kind of where it was left. We didn't really take much away from this. That was back, let's see, uh, June of 23. And then like the next day at the Ubisoft forward event, we got an actual look at the game. An actual look. What a, what a novel idea, right? Getting to see actual gameplay footage. And what they showed off was actually really good. <laughs> like it was so good. It made a lot of people kind of uh, surprised, honestly. They make sure to say work in progress does not re represent final quality. Normally, I feel like when we see that, it's because the game is going to look better when it launches. But in this case, when we go through this, it's almost like they're saying it might look worse than this at launch. Maybe. Just don't get your hopes up too much. Cute little monster. Oh my God, he's so cute. He's so cute. Good boy. I want that fighter stripped for parts by tomorrow. And then transition to gameplay. Right, next. Let's go get paid. For one, immediate thing that jumps out to me, they're playing this in ultra wide. Pretty rare. Not many games do ultra wide uh, for their their like previews and demos and stuff. Very interesting. It makes it look more cinematic. That's part of the reason I think that this looks really, really cinematic. That's one thing that's kind of surprising. Cinematic or ultra wide is just the aspect ratio. In case you're not familiar, this is a, a standard kind of cinematic aspect ratio, 21 by nine um, or something roughly similar to that. And a normal trailer, normal gameplay is in 16 by 9, which is the standard for most monitors and TVs. In other words, this full frame that you see on screen right now for the stream, or for the stream clip, if you're watching Lou Stevens live afterwards, um, would normally be filled with gameplay. But it's ultra wide, so it comes off as much more cinematic. And a lot of people have asked, like, I remember I took a, a class on, uh, it was in like, I think community college. So it was like a, a, an extracurricular, you know, trying to fill in credits however I could. And it was like a film appreciation class that was really interesting. But one of the things that they went through, we spent like a few days talking about it, were aspect ratios and frame rates. Because one of the common things people will often say is like, there's something about going to the movies that just makes it feel like a movie. Watching it on my TV at home just doesn't feel right. And part of that is the scale and the epic nature of it. Part of it is that projectors used in movie theaters are very, very different in how it actually appears to the human eye than television sets are, at least standard television uh, sets that you may have. But also a part of it is the big uh, screen with the massive aspect ratio that's a little bit thinner paired with the lower frame rate is just what we've been conditioned to associate with the cinema experience. It's not that 24 FPS is actually the best frame rate. It's just that that way back when was literally the lowest frame rate they could go while it's still looking 
or with it still looking relatively smooth because back then it was physical film. They needed to save physical film. So they lowered the frame rate to get it to that point where it could actually be like <laughs> used practically. Now it's, it's very different where we don't have those restrictions. So you can kind of just do whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. However, everybody's grown up associating lo those lower frame rates and those wide aspect ratios with cinema, with a cinematic look. And so we just associate the two things together. And I think that's part of the vibe that they're going with here. The one exception is we're getting this in 60 FPS. So the game is allegedly running. I don't know if it's running on um, an actual PlayStation 5 or Xbox or if it's running on like a PC. The fact that it's ultra wide makes me think it's a PC with a controller plugged in because I don't know, maybe somebody in chat can correct me. I can't think of a a console game that has ultra wide support, um, plugging into the console. I don't think most consoles even have it. So it's probably a PC, uh, version of the game running, but still, um, very, very interesting. And the ultra wide aspect ratio, I think is definitely carefully selected to make it look more cinematic. I think it's an Xbox controller because X for takedown. I can't imagine they would have X slash a be the takedown. It's gotta be gotta be that stabbing us in the back as she's preparing to yes. stab her in the back so you see that there's an actual companion command system this to me makes me wonder if it's just our little companion here or if there's going to be more companions in the game that you can direct and command in this way that's interesting nice one. could lead for some really or lead to some really interesting platforming sections and times when you interact with companions little flyover sequence it also makes me wonder if there's uh like right there she dropped down but it makes me wonder if there's ways to go through these encounters just bypassing combat entirely because you see that box just went all the way up here to the left what if she had jumped off up here and then just walked straight out the door because you see she spotted here because she dropped down like a moron <laughs> where she shouldn't have but presumably this crate that you were hanging on, you could have dropped down up on this upper platform and just bypassed combat entirely, which is pretty cool. I was just leaving. Okay, okay, we'll figure this out. Looks like me playing with a controller. Just totally helpless. So this was kind of interesting. There's like blaster modules. You can change different archetypes of damage going out. So it's like one blaster, but it's got three different uses that present like presumably could be um, adjusted and altered. So that's kind of cool. I want to know, what did she say? Does anyone know what that means? Can someone in chat Google that real quick? What does that mean? I want to know. What does that mean? Definitely looks upscaled. So the typical give like giveaways for upscaling as we've typically seen it with like DLSS or FSR is with, it's a Star Wars curse. Okay. I'm just not. Basically, God damn it. Okay. It's just not, I'm not up to date with my Star Wars lore. I'm sorry. I know my name is Luke, but it's just Star Wars swear words. Okay. Um, so the typical giveaway for upscaling in these types of things is going to be in fringe areas. And then also hair is the very common place where you can spot it. You can also usually spot it in like fine gradations of the ground where like little bitty pebbles and ground textures are trying to be upscaled and it's just not working very well. This, honestly, I'm not seeing the typical fringing around the model that you would expect to see with an upscaled model like that. Um, of course, I'm not pixel counting, so I don't know if this is running in native 4K or not, or if this is just like 
there's a little. So maybe there there is some. But it almost looks like a quality mode. So they might have this running with DLSS or something like that. But it's probably like a quality setting that's pretty high, like going from 1440p up to 4K. It does not look like a really aggressive upscale. We've seen some really aggressive ones with like Jedi Survivor at launch where they were running that thing at like 900p upscaling it to 1440 and it was it's not great. So um, if there is upscaling, it's a it's minimal, I would guess. So bear in mind, one of the things I pointed out earlier is that she could have waited to jump off the crate until she was up on the upper landing, still taking down that one last guy that was up there and then walked out here. So presumably there was a way for this combat encounter to go where there wasn't combat, where she just hops on the speeder and runs off to the mission hub and bypasses combat entirely. And if that's the case, I mean, that's kind of the dream. That's what you would hope is that there's variability. And as we'll see in the rest of this, there's a lot of examples of them making it out that there's going to be a lot of option and agency in how the player approaches these things and how they handle it. So if they can live up to that expectation, this could be pretty cool. She mounts it. Then we have a speeder bike chase. It actually looks pretty good. Lots of data streaming in and out. This is one thing I've always said is really impressive about Ubisoft games. Ubisoft, they are really good at data streaming. They just are. Assassin's Creed games have always been great at this, especially the recent ones where you can have an actual like eagle or hawk flying above you and then you warp to its perspective, fly across the country of Egypt and then within two or three seconds, snap right back to the player character standing on a pyramid. Like it's crazy what they're able to stream in and out. They, they have some really impressive data streaming tech. And this is another example of it. I mean, it allows you to move very quickly to have uh, a really high density maps and areas while traveling quickly. It, it's just a great asset to have at your disposal. This also, like people were asking, oh, Luke, you want, I'm sorry, I, I didn't make it more than, more than 10 minutes into this without bringing it up, but uh, speaking of space games, this speeder thing, this is all I wanted in Starfield. This is all I was hoping for was to have like procedurally generated maps, kind of like this, where you have a speeder and you can zip around to go and hunt for loot and cool locations. That's all I wanted. This is all I was talking about. People are like, oh, so you want like dirt bikes and pickup trucks and a cyber truck? It's like, no, I just want a speeder bike. That's not like that far out of the realm of possibility in the sense of like a sci-fi game. Like, what are we doing? Sorry, I know, Dave, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't not bring it up when we talk about anything star related. But in terms of what we see, pretty big area. Our understanding is after they've described um, how this worked is that these planets that you land on are just gonna be basically big maps. Kind of think of how Jedi Survivor or Jedi Fallen Order handled it, where you land on the planet, but it's basically just one big map in a landing area. And honestly, that's the same way that like the Star Wars films kind of handle it. You know, like it, it, no matter where they go, they, they're landing on Hoth and everything's happening on this one small, like two, three square mile area on the entire planet. This is where it's all going down. You know, it, it just is kind of how it has to be because when you're dealing with planets, it doesn't really work for stories or for games or films or whatever to have it be like, yes, and there's 650 different military bases all preparing to launch uh, like these these escape teams and they're all launching into space. And because it's the far future slash ancient past long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, you know, it, it doesn't really work to be like, yes. And then there's going to be billions of people escaping Hoth and headed off to another planet where 35 billion people are waiting. Like, it just doesn't really work that well. It doesn't align with our experience. So you have to have a singular place where everything goes down. And in this case, I think they're approaching it the same way where when you land on this particular planet, you're always going to be landing on this big map that's going to be very large, but it's not like you can just circumnavigate the, the globe or anything. Interesting thing here, Pike Syndicate reputation. This suggests there are factions, a whole faction and reputation system. So 
presumably the Pike Syndicate is the group that you just were stealing from and that you killed a lot of their friends. And so you robbed them and now your reputation with them dropped. So there's a reputation faction system working here. That's crazy. I will say here is where you can see some of the fringing that would suggest probably some upscaling. It's also hard to tell because it's YouTube and things get compressed. There's John's us home. We made it, Nix. What I kind of love about this, though, is that so much stuff is blowing and happening on screen at any given time. Like the grass is all blowing. The trees are blowing. There's rocks blowing across the dirt path. People on other speeder bikes going over. There's just so much going on all at the same time. You know, it's it just makes the world feel very, very alive. Hops off the speeder bike. That's a big lizard dog right there. No load screen either. Hey, Andy. You're late, Kay. Doc is waiting. Look how silky that was. Oh, baby. I love the gameplay to cinematic transitions. I love it. I love this stuff. But look how smooth this is. Hey, Andy. You're late, Kay. Like, waiting. come on. Come on. You got to give them credit where it's due. That was smooth. Oh, that was that was good. That was good. So I'll like <laughs> one of the comments, Hatman, this is just too good for Ubisoft WTF. So that's kind of the core question that's on everybody's minds right now. Um, everybody's wondering that same thing. This looks too good to be true. Like if this was coming from a naughty dog or if this was coming from uh, Santa Monica, they landed a Star Wars license. Could be cool. Could be cool. But like this all seems very, very smooth, very, very good. And we're not really used to seeing that from recent Ubisoft. We're used to seeing kind of the same game recycled over and over again. And that is a very fair question to bring up, I think. But at the same time, this is a, a game being put together by a pretty fresh team, a group that's done The Division, but has never done this type of game before. So it could be that they're bringing a really cool, novel approach to it. That's very, very possible. They've also had a lot of time. You remember also Ubisoft basically delayed everything after Ghost Recon Breakpoint by like a year and a half to two years and suffered serious stock downgrades as a result. Their investors were not happy with them, but they delayed everything to give it extra time, extra polish, make sure when they revealed stuff that it would be revealed and when they released it, it would be released in the best possible state. We've seen that recently. Mirage was a fun little side project that was actually received really, really well. And it looks like this new Prince of Persia game is probably also going to review really well. And then it also seems like, you know, they're working on AC Red. That's going to be really cool. Avatar, potentially an exception, hopefully. Uh, Avatar kind of mixed reviews, but it also seems like it was caught in development hell a little bit because they had so much handholding from uh, Disney to do uh, because working with Disney on any collaborative thing seems like a bit of a headache. Star Wars, I think, is a little bit looser. They seem to be a little bit more flexible with it, specifically because they're working with Lucas uh, Games or LucasArts or Lucasfilm Games, whatever the official name of it is, whereas Avatar was working with uh, Lightstorm, so which is a different group that doesn't really do a lot of video games. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. What? Are you worried? No. Okay. No, but you're Troy. What? Be careful. Donka's a broker, not a friend. She can't be trusted. Who can out here? See you back at the ship. Gotta love the beads. Round two and I still like my odds. Cave back already. I mean, the one thing that I'm blown away by is the the quality of the depth of field effect. 
I don't think people understand just how crazy difficult it is to do this. Like video game engines don't really, like they're not actually simulating light realistically. They are trying to make it look like they are. <laughs> so it's a lot of trickery usually that happens. They'll put blurring effects over it and then scale the severity and and potency of the blur and adjust that kind of logarithmically based on the distance from the camera and stuff. So there's ways that they can kind of cheese it, but you don't normally end up with a super smooth transition from out of focus to in focus. That is very difficult to do. And that, I mean, it's these little touches that make it look so good and so cinematic because again, normally you just don't see that in video games. Normally you see a kind of clunky blur and then it's in focus and then clunky blur behind them. So it just looks really, really good. She's fresh, but she's good. Who's this? Just a friend. Join us. Job was more complicated than you said, Dunka. You lived. <laughs> Hey, these aren't toys. They're investments. <laughs> Wait, we haven't met. Don't really know many of you. Stealing illegal contraband, running with syndicates. I could say you're a threat to the Empire. You could. But I won't have to if you're smart. And then another option for player agency. We saw earlier a faction system with reputations at play. Now we're seeing uh, uh, like options for bribing or not bribing with potentially different outcomes. Because earlier when we escaped the base, it seemed like maybe you could have done that stealthily and not alerted anybody. In which case, maybe you get paid better. Does that dialogue change where she says, the job was harder than expected. Does she change it to, oh, it's a walk in the park. Does that dialogue change? Like how much of this is actually flexible versus linear? I'm okay if it's linear. I just hate when games pretend like they're variable, when they pretend like there's player choice and then there just isn't any. It's one of my frustrations with like Horizon because Horizon Zero Dawn and Forbidden West have those dialogue options where they make it into like this, they make you think that you are going to have a different outcome if you're really aggressive or compassionate or kind of snarky. And it doesn't actually matter. It doesn't go anywhere. It just, it just doesn't matter. Exactly, Bulls. It's just the illusion of choice. Thanks, but I'm smart enough to get myself out of trouble. You pay the tax just like everyone else. Whoa, kid, let's just relax. You won't make it off to Shara alive. Maybe. Then you get a credit payout. Presumably you would get less if you bribed her. We have report to the fugitive in Georgia's hope. Move to apprehend. That's pretty that smooth. That announcement wouldn't be about you, would it? Uh, could be. I told you not to trust her. Uh-oh. Not the first time we've outrun the Empire. Run right up and on the ship. A workbench? To leave. Yeah, no kidding. Sit down, A to take off. It goes into a cinematic. Launches into the atmosphere. And here to be clear, behind my camera, you can see this. This looks to me like a loading screen. And I think this is just like a really elaborate way of covering up the loading screen between planet surface and space. Then through some clouds. And maybe that's like a wanted level. I don't know. Yeah, you're right, CG James. I think that is just a wanted level. <laughs> Nothing on the sensors. Tashara orbit. 
Anybody on the and then some dogfight action. You also see an option for hyperdrive down here in the bottom left. You have different rockets, the ability to repair your ship as well. Flying all through this old wreckage of ships and stuff for dogfights. It seems very interesting. But I, I think that this also demonstrates why that fluid transition, there is a load screen technically happening. It's just happening under the hood and in a way that the player is not torn out of their immersion in the game. They're still playing the game the whole time. Yes, they lose control of the ship while it's going out of the atmosphere, but then they're just like, you know, they, they regain control of it pretty much immediately. Same with this hyperdrive warping away. You're still in the game. That was a load screen and now we're here. And honestly, like if you count the amount of time uh, from when it starts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, basically twelve fast seconds, <laughs> which is probably longer than the load screens in Starfield are uh, on average. And yet this seems so much better just because it doesn't take you out of the game. It keeps you in it. It just covers up the load with like a little bitty uh, transition in a way that's satisfying and interesting. And then we get another cutscene that looks pretty good. I mean, it just, the whole game looks coherent. It looks cohesive. It's clear there's a vision here. There's a, a tone that's being struck that seems consistent. There are interesting worlds to explore very different maps, different combat encounters. The combat looks actually kind of interesting with different archetypes for your gun. There's a workbench for upgrading and changing stuff. It actually looks pretty good. Graphically, it looks really, really good. Like there's really not much to complain about. And I think this is broadly the point that a lot of people have raised is just, it looks almost too good. And so for Ubisoft with this, I think that they are onto something. I think if this actually lives up to the hype this could actually be like a huge game for this year i really do think so i think you could see this game just blow up if it actually lives up to that quality standard if this thing gets reviewed and ends up with like nines a handful of nines it could easily end up in that discussion for game of the year at the end of it you guys remember assassin's creed odyssey got nominated against god of war and red dead redemption 2 2018 was a crazy year, man. Uh, I could see this if it reviews well, being in the same category, same discussion, because it's a huge IP. The game already looks really good. The interest is definitely there. They just have to live up to that expectation. Imagine Ubisoft getting game of the year. Yeah. Massive is uh, like the Insomniac games of Ubisoft. Yeah, they have done a really good job. I think, I think Avatar was a tough one for them because when I went to that preview event, when we talked to the devs, like, of course, they can't say it's been really tough to make this game because dealing with Lightstorm has been a headache. But I got the vibe that that's kind of what they were saying, because anytime they wanted to do anything, they had to go to Lightstorm, which is the company that James Cameron owns that makes the Avatar films. They had to go to Lightstorm, explain why they wanted this done, how they wanted it done and go through all these reasons. And then there was like a multi-week process of sending ideas and revisions back and forth. And the Lightstorm team, they're making the like Avatar three right now. And then I think there's another movie after that that's also happening. So they're very, very busy and they're trying to also throw in this stuff for the games. And it just seems like it was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a headache because they wanted to do all this great stuff for Avatar. And anytime they had a single idea, they had to wait basically a month to get a green light to start working on it. So uh, that's why I think the game took so long. That is a game that probably should have released like three years ago, three, four years ago. But as a result of the slow delay pro or the slow development process, I think it just was stretched out. And that's why so much of Avatar Frontiers of Pandora feels like a game from like 2019, 2020. It doesn't actually feel like their current modus operandi. It's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. But so far they've done it right. I feel like the responses to the previews have been very positive. And if you just go through some of the reviews or some of the, the comments, like 3.8 million views, almost 3.9 million just six months ago, it's the most interest in a Ubisoft game in a minute. So yeah, people saying they love the detail with the reputation system. 
Um, this is looking pretty good. My only changes I'd like to see is the gun should be puncher. Each shot hits harder, gives more feedback, and the vehicle should feel faster. I don't know. The vehicles felt pretty fast. I bet when you're playing it, it also feels really fast. They kind of float forward rather than speed through the environment, at least with the current perspective. Otherwise, this is looking pretty good, and I can't wait to see the finished product. I, I think it probably feels different when you're controlling it, because that's true of a lot of games. When you're playing the game and you're like playing the vehicle, it feels very different than when you're actually just watching it, you know? Finally, a, a game where you don't play as a Jedi or a soldier. I hope this has a lot of crime theme to it with bounty hunters, mercenaries, the huts, and the spice cartel. Oh, yeah. Um, this is amazing. I'm so happy you can exit planets just like that and fly on them. Too bad Starfield doesn't have that in nice detail. I would want to see in the release is having a hyperdrive jump lines line up with the stars as I believe that's what those lines are. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be super cool. I'm having a hard time believing this is a Ubisoft game. It looks too good. 17 thousand upvotes like but that is exactly the point that is exactly the point people see this and they're so used to ubisoft games being just kind of mid that this is like surprising a lot of people so if they can pull this off this could be a whole like the, the jump start for a whole new generation of next gen or i guess now current gen ubisoft games where people are seeing this and it's just like the, they are using their amazing tech and they give their teams time. Maybe it might also uh, me. I mean, there's other options as well. Maybe this is that good and it's a one-off fluke. You know, maybe it's just that this is amazing. It's just, is the one game that kind of got lucky and they figured it out. It worked out really well. Players loved it, but nothing else they do is that great. Or it doesn't live up to this expectation. Who knows? What I will say is that over the last decade, we've gotten kind of used to Ubisoft being viewed in a certain light. But back in like the late 2000s, Ubisoft was making some of the biggest games of the year. Ubisoft was making games that were commonly in the contention for the unanimous best game of the year. They were at the, the top of the heap back in the late 2000s. And then through the 20 teens, they kind of had some struggles here and there and they were trying to get their footing under them and they've certainly wasted a lot of time and a lot of money on projects that didn't pan out but it's not impossible to think that they could come back it's not out of the realm of possibility fresh thank you also for the ten dollar super chat very generous i think this game is going to sell like hogwarts and i think it may release in september or november also do you think we may get a disc collector's edition Disc Collector's Edition, I'm not sure. I do think we'll see a Collector's Edition. It just seems like a layup. Ubisoft's typically done a really good job with those. So I would expect that they probably do that. And um, as for sales, I think it's going to be hard to beat Hogwarts Legacy just because Hogwarts is such a, I mean, Harry Potter is such a huge franchise. It's ridiculous. And that game was the first game like that for that fan base. We've had other narrative third person adventure Star Wars games. This just looks like a potentially really good one. With Harry Potter, we had never gotten a game that's just like an open world game where you're playing as a student and you can explore the castle freely. That alone was enough for a lot of people to want to buy the game. Like I, I remember people saying before the launch, like on the subreddit, they're like, even if the game sucks, I don't care. I just want to explore the castle. I just want to do that. That's all I want. If I have to pay 60, 70 bucks just to explore Hogwarts Castle myself on my PS5, I'll do that. I don't care. Even if the game sucks, I'll still be happy. And that's a level of <laughs> interest in the franchise that I just don't think Star Wars Outlaws has going for it. But I could see this selling like, you know, five to 10 million copies if it reviews well. Even if it doesn't review super well, even if it's like an eight out of 10, I still see this selling pretty well, I think. Like Jorah said, Hogwarts is more accessible to all people versus Star Wars, weirdly enough. Some people still think it's geeky. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And it's also just that there's been a lot more content around Star Wars. Star Wars fans have had a, an ocean of content to feast on basically for 40 years. And Harry Potter, you know, they, they had the movies and then some like spinoff games that were terrible. And then they had like another trilogy of movies that weren't very good, but like, that's kind of it. Like they've done some mobile games and stuff, but like, that's basically it. You have the movies, the theme parks, and that's all that people can kind of agree is good about the Harry Potter franchise is those things. And I mean, the books, you have the books, movies, and you know, but books slash movies are kind of the same thing. It's the same stories. So I, I think that there's just been a glut for Harry Potter fans. And then they got this great feast before them in the form of Hogwarts Legacy. So it did very well. Whereas Star Wars, I just don't think is fan, fans have had plenty, you know, to, to go at. Not great, 
recently, but they've had stuff. What are you thinking for a release date? I I think, you know, they're, they, they're saying 2024. They're still saying it's this year. There were rumors that it was going to try to squeeze into this fiscal year, um, which means before March. I don't see that happening. I think that this gets a pretty lengthy marketing campaign behind it. So I'm guessing holiday. I, I would not be surprised if this was like a November release right before the holidays. Um, and, you know, they really go balls to the walls with the marketing on it. That would be my expectation. So I'm expecting holidays. This will be their big game. But the other thing to consider, they have Assassin's Creed Red for this year. So you could presumably get a huge Assassin's Creed game in like September to October and then Star Wars Outlaws in like November, December. That's possible. Two huge Ubisoft games, basically back to back. And what I will say is when we went to that, that, media event for Avatar, I met with a lot of the marketing team at Ubisoft, delightful people, super sweet, love them to death. And like the team that works on the marketing for Avatar, they move on and they start working on the marketing for um, Prince of Persia. And then they move on and work on the marketing for whatever comes next. I think Skull and Bones after that, like they just move from thing to thing to thing to from release to release to release. So they're probably not doing two huge marketing campaigns at the same time. They're probably focused on one, get that done and out the door and then move on to the next one, which probably means that they want a couple of months between, I would think. So that would probably mean that we get like maybe September for Assassin's Creed and then November for Star Wars or vice versa. Either one of those I think could work. Potentially Star Wars Outlaws versus Indiana Jones versus AC Red. Potentially, yeah. Because Indiana Jones is supposed to be this year basically. So there's gonna be some real competition I think. It's gonna be a crazy, crazy winter and fall. I don't think it's really hit people just how busy it's gonna be. Um, I, I do think that from like probably April, May, somewhere in there to probably August, there's not gonna be much at all. Um, so I've got to start budgeting, but uh, there's really not going to be that much to talk about or cover. But I do think that once we hit the fall, it's going to be kind of a mad rush. He took my thing.